So we need to review for summative number four, and all of these topics, this is the first time we've tested them, so <clears throat> I expect to be a, this video being viewed a few times. Um, some of the things are pretty old, like these quadratic applications and qu quadratic forms. We haven't tested this yet, so make sure you go back and revisit those assignments. Um, I can graph a parabola in vertex form. So this parabola is in vertex form. The first thing I have my students do is identify where the vertex is. The vertex is at, let's see, positive 4, comma 1. And then I usually have you guys make a t-table, you know, something like this. Oh man, but that's not what I do. I usually put the vertex in the middle of our t-table. It does say we need five points this time. Um, so the ordered pair of 4 and 1 I'll kind of throw in the middle here. And then maybe we could come up with two ordered pairs on each side of the vertex. That'd be good. I was kind of getting away with graphing just three of them last time, but go big or go home here on our summative. So if you pick symmetrical points for a parabola surrounding a vertex, they're going to come out symmetrically placed on the graph. Um, I'm going to go x equals 3 and x equals 2, and then the other direction, 5 and 6. And you can either use your table to complete the rest of this table, or you could plug in numbers pretty effectively, guys. Plugging in a 2, 2 minus 4 is negative 2 squared would be a 4, but it's 1 half times 4, so it's 2 plus 1, which is 3. And then plugging in a 3, this one, that was kind of a silly point for me to choose because I'm going to get a fraction, but whatever. Um, 3 minus 4 is negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1. So this is 1 half plus 1, which is 1.5. Yuck. <laughs> and then if you go and plug in those values, you're going to get um, the same y values because it's symmetrical. So when you go to plot your parabola, we have, let's see, oh my gosh, I can't read that. <laughs> one, two, three, four, one. And then three, oh, please. I'm not going to be able to graph this. Who am I kidding? All right, going up one and a half. And then six, going up one, two, three. Oh my gosh, be golly. This is going to be terrible. Here we go. See, I already missed. Oh my gosh. All right. So I'm grabbing on a tablet, so you got to give me a little bit of leeway here, guys. But do remember that I expect you to plot and find these points accurately. Um, I really don't mind if you use technology to find them. However, I think we can all agree we could do that without technology if we had to. So now can you find the vertex if it's in standard form? So you can either try that weird completing the square thing, or what most kids settled on is they prefer to use this um, symmetry finder formula. So the axis of symmetry is negative b over 2a. And if I can figure out what that number is, that's the x value that splits your parabola in half. It also happens to be the x value of the vertex. So negative b for us would be positive 24 over, and then 2 times the a value would be 2 times 6, which is 12. So 24 over 12 gives us a 2. And then in order to find um, the y value, you would go to your function and you plug in a 2. So 6 times 2 squared minus 24 times 2 plus 5, which, uh, oh boy, I'm going to cheat. I think I have the answer key here. If only, right? Looks like it's 19. All right, we'll go with that. Uh, obviously, y'all can add. I'm really tired right now, and I can't. <clears throat> so here, I want you to be able to convert between the two forms. Um, this is standard form. I want you to write it in vertex form. So you can either find the vertex like we did in the previous question. So once you have the vertex, you now remember this is h and k. And then you can clearly see the a value in this question is going to be a, two, a negative 2. Excuse me. So once you find h and k through that formula, you can go throw this into your vertex formula, which is this guy, remember. So a value, remember this was a negative 2. You'd have to go find h and k through the vertex formula. That's fine. That's one method. And that method works out really, really well. But just for the sake of, um, well, frankly, it's fun for me. I'm going to show you that modified completing the square idea where you have to do all the completing the square on the right side. You can't touch the left side. <clears throat> so if you want to use that method, and if you don't want to use this method, I suggest you skip over this part of the video so you don't get confused. But you look at the first two parts of the existing quadratic. And I know to complete the square, this first number has to be a 1. So if it's not a 1, Normally we divide it out when we're solving, but here we can't do that, so we're going to factor it out. So if you factor out a negative 2 from there, this becomes a positive x squared, and then this will become a minus 4x. And that is the quadratic that I'm going to complete. Now, this negative 1 that was already in the problem is just going to kind of hang off to the side here. 
Um, but remember, you added this blank here. So you're going to also have a blank here, but since it's on the same side of the equal sign, instead of adding the blank twice, you're going to add it here and then subtract it here. All right, it's about to get crazy. This blank is half of your b squared. So if you cut this in half, that's negative 2 squared is a 4. But it's not really a 4. Remember, this is really a negative 8. So you're really subtracting a negative 8 to keep it balanced over here. All right, this one got really messy all of a sudden. Negative 2. The reason we completed the square here, guys, was so it could factor. It factors into x minus 2 squared. And then here you just combine them. Uh, negative 1 minus negative 8. That's like negative 1 plus 8. So that would be a plus 7. And voila, you are in vertex form. Now, if you suffered through that and you're still confused, I might suggest you go over here and try this method, where you use your negative b over 2a formula to find the h value. Plug it in to find the k value and then plug all the pieces into the formula. But spoiler alert, you get that same same function no matter which method you choose. All right, if I give you a parabola with a couple clues, you should be able to write your equation. So this clue right here, this is our vertex, so I know that's my h and that's my k. And then this random ordered pair here, it is the y-intercept, which is kind of cool, um, but it's also just an xy ordered pair. So since I have the vertex, I'm going to start by looking at vertex form which I know looks like this. I'm going to plug in everything I know. So the y value is from the point I was given, so that's a 2. I do not know the a value. You might think you can guess it, but I suggest you not, because I'm going to ask you to <laughs> show me your work. And then the x value from the point is 0, minus the h value is from your vertex, which is 3. That quantity is squared. And then you're supposed to say, like, plus k, but remember k is negative 1, so if you just wrote subtract 1, you're totally fine with that. Um, let's clean this up a little bit. So you have 2 equals a, this is negative 3 squared, so that's times 9, this is a minus 1. So you're going to add the 1 over, and you get 3 equals a times 9, or 9a, and then divide both sides by 9, and I'm glad I didn't guess the a value, because I was not about to guess a 1 -third. Now, you're not home free, guys. All you just found for me is the a value, which is going to go right there. So the other thing is that you know the h and k, these guys. So you're going to put your h here and your k here, and everything else stays as the generic formula. Standard, not standard, vertex form. So y equals, you just found one third for the a value. And then it's x minus h, which was x minus 3, quantity squared, don't forget that part. And then plus negative 1, I'm just going to change that to a minus 1. And there is your parabola. So that question takes a little bit of muscle. you gotta, you got to get through it. And don't be surprised if your A value isn't necessarily what you anticipated it to be. And even if you are a good guesser and you think you got it, I don't care. I still need to see the graph. Or the work, excuse me. Um, here we are graphing quadratic applications. And we're going to be using our graphing calculator to answer some questions. So this is our projectile motion question. Um, measured in feet per second squared there for gravity since it's negative 16, but um, we're going to type this into our calculator. So get that typed into y equals. I'm going to pause the video for a moment. You pause as well. So I have my function typed in. Um, depending on what the last kid did on your computer, on your calculator, your window may or may not be appropriate. So this is an object that's being like kicked or launched or thrown at 75 feet per second, and it starts 12 feet up in the air. Um, so I think 0 to 100 for x, which is time, is like way too much. So let's pull that back to like 20. And then for height, um, I don't think 900 feet's appropriate, right? We're just, we're starting 12 feet in the air. They're kicking it at not a really great velocity. Um, let's see if 100 is okay. Maybe. I don't know. Let's hit graph. Oh, so close. Um, I actually think we're okay with this window, but I, I want a little bit of wiggle room here, guys. Um, I'm going to change a few things. I'm going to change my y minimum to go to negative 10, which I know is weird, but I want to have a little bit of a window leeway, and I'm going to go 120. Because I think there's a question where I have to find when it hits the ground. There we go. So the time is way overboard. I could have pulled that back to 10 seconds as well. You know what? While we're at it, I'll go ahead and change that. I'm not so good at estimating these questions. Sometimes i got to finagle with the window for a while. All right, so the question that was asked of us was when will it hit the ground? So on our calculator, the place where it hits the ground is right here, the x-intercept. 
which we know we find by going to the trace menu, or calc menu, excuse me, second trace, and number two is the zero finder. So you need to submit a question that's slightly to the left of this uh, intercept right here. So I'm going to go at, I can estimate the time, it's one, two, three, four, five, it's like right before five seconds. So I'm going to go four seconds to be on the left bound. Remember I got a hop because mine's delayed. And then, you know, five seconds is definitely to the right of it. So I'm going to go to the five for my right bound. And that was a little close to Bruzo. Whoopsies. Enter one more time. Looks like it hits the ground at 4.84 seconds. So remember, you're going to be responsible for... Um, you have to be able to know where on your calculator to go. So when it hits the ground is when you go to second trace and you choose number two, which is the zero finder. And you have to be able to execute those steps without any assistance from me, so keep that in mind. Oh, these questions. I love these questions with the little charts. So you employ eight salespeople who average 40 sales um, per store visited. As you increase your number of people by two, the number of sales drops by four. So find the total number of sales that will help you maximize sales. So how about we make a little chart so we have like the number of people that are selling for us. Wow, I can't write. Um, and then the average, what is it, what is it called here? Uh, sales per store. Okay. And then the last column is technically revenue, but something that my kids picked up on real quick was you really don't need to fill out that column because that's going to be the algebra stuff that your calculator is going to handle. So eight salespeople is what they start with. Oh my goodness, my tablet's being extra naughty today. Here we go. Um, eight people and it's 40 sales per store. But if you increase it by two, so now you're looking at 10 people, uh, you're going to drop this down to 36 because it says it drops by four. So I could come up with some other examples, but I know that when you multiply these together, you get your, um, oops, not revenue, that was the wrong word, sales. Wow, that's ugly. Okay, uh, so here, let's come up with some algebra that describes what's going on in this column. You started with eight people, and then you're going to be jumping by increments of two people. So every two people that you increase would be plus 2x. Now for this column, let's write up some algebra. You started with 40 sales per store but you're going to drop in increments of four. So that's what I'm going to type in my calculator. This times this into y1. Okay, so I'm running a little short on time because I would like to go home and make my kids dinner. So what I'm going to tell you to do is I want you to type this into y1 and you kind of mess around with the window a little bit. Remember what x represents. It's the, um, like, how many... In how many increases of people did you do? So it shouldn't be anything crazy. So like for X's, I would go from like, I don't know, probably zero to 10 is good. Um, I'm not sure about the Y's. You're gonna have to mess around with the, the vertical, the range on that window for a little bit. But what I can tell you, because Mrs. Hoffbauer already keyed this for me, bless her heart, uh, she finds out that when you find that maximum, because remember you're gonna graph it, I know this is really ugly, but, you know, it looks something like this. Oh my gosh, <laughs> so ugly. The maximum here is at the ordered pair 3, 392. So it, the question says, find the total number of salespeople. So they want you to find this number here. So x plus, sorry, 8 plus 2x is how you find that number. And I noticed that x is 3. So you're going to have to do 8 plus 2 times 3. So 8 plus 6 is 14 people. That's the magic answer right there. Don't tell me x equals 3 and then stop the question because you have not actually finished the question yet. Be careful. <clears throat> All right. This next one here, we're evaluating a polynomial function, so it shouldn't be too tricky for us. Just make sure that you are... Uh, I love mental math. I think it's awesome, but maybe not on your test, or at least um, maybe double-check your mental math. So if you're evaluating this function at 4, you're placing a 4 everywhere for the input variable, and you're going to compute an answer, and since I am no longer doing mental math today, I'm going to steal an answer from the great and wonderful Hofbauer, and it is 31, apparently. Whoops. 
So that's your answer on that function evaluation. So same function, but this time you're evaluating it with a negative 1. All the more reason for you to um, <laughs> be using a calculator if you struggle with this. Uh, this is the part where kids actually mess up. Sometimes they don't type with parentheses if they're using calculators. But right here, a lot of you think you're supposed to multiply the 3 times 4 first and then square it. That's not how math works. You have to do exponents before you do multiplication. So keep that in mind. Anyways, the great and wonderful Hofbauer told me the answer here is 16. You like how I'm making her the scapegoat? Because if this is wrong, then it's her fault, right? <laughs> no, it's mine. I should have checked it. All right, so this next question, we're going to find the average rate of change between x equals 4 and x equals 2. And remember, average rate of change is just really fancy for slope between those two points. So what I have my kids do is, you know, write, write them up as ordered pairs. I think that helps. <clears throat> um, when you plug in a 4, let's see, 3, oh boy, is that the same function? I don't know. Oh, it is the same function. Look at that. Um, I think we plugged in a 4 a minute ago, didn't we? Wasn't it 31? Now, we did not plug in a 2 yet, so let's see here. 2, 4, 5, what was that, 7? So finding the average rate of change, which we know is just finding slope, would be 7 minus 31 over 2 minus 4. I did that in a weird order, but what's new? Um, what is that? Negative 24 over negative 2, which reduces to a wonderful 12. Average rate of change is 12 between x equals 2 and x equals 4. All right, same function. Is it a function? Well, that was probably stupid for me to ask it that way. But if you graphed this, it's a parabola. I don't really know exactly what it looks like, but something like this. So yes, this is a function. My rationale could be um, that it passes the vertical line test. So you, if you judge this by the vertical line test, you have to show me that it passes the vertical line test. You have to give me a little sketch. Draw something that is not a function. Oh man, possibilities are endless here, guys. One of these little sideways parabolas. These are not functions, right? Because they fail the vertical line test. So keep that in mind. Oh boy, this one. So I'm going to write the skeleton of my function. And then I'm going to go ahead and evaluate it at a, excuse me, a minus 4. And my mean teacher, that's me, <coughs> is going to want me to simplify this. So a minus 4 quantity squared, this is going to be the problem. It's a minus 4 times another a minus 4, and there's also a 3 out in front of it. So you have to do this in stages. Um, I'll come back to that. Let's go ahead and distribute the negative 6 here. So this is negative 6a plus 24. And then plus 7 doesn't do anything. That's boring. So let's go ahead and foil this out. I know some of you can do like amazing uh, foiling in your head real quick, and that's awesome. Just remember it's a test. So slow down a little. Uh, 8a squared minus 8a plus 16 is this distributed out. However, you still have to multiply it by a, a 3. So, and don't forget, all of this has to come down too. So we have 3a squared minus 24a plus 48, and then we still have a minus 6a, and a plus 24, and a plus 7. Oh my goodness. All right. I am super tired, so hopefully Hofbauer has a nice answer for me to steal. Let's see, 3a squared. I knew that part. And we have negative 24a minus 6a, so what is that? Minus 30a. And then plus 48 and a plus 7 would be a, I think a bruiser, I think 55. Let's see if I match her key. This is like a test for me, huh? Oh, I don't match her key. What did I do? Oh, man. I don't know. I did something really dumb. 48. Oh. <laughs> Ruzo. There's like a whole term here. Ignore me. What was that? 55? So, 79. <gasps> good news. I match her answer key now. Oh gosh, that was embarrassing. Sorry guys. All right. <laughs> Lesson learned. So now I want to talk about domain and range. If I give you a picture of a function, can you tell me what the domain and range are in interval notation only, please? So the domain stretches from left to right, and this one does extend forever left and right. So we say the domain goes from negative infinity to infinity. Um, and the range is from low to high for y values, so I can see that it kind of bottoms out at y equals 0, 
that's the lowest it goes, and then it goes up forever to infinity. Notice I used a bracket on zero because there are ordered pairs that exist there. This is um, one of the last things I kind of threw at you right before the review day. So if you are watching this early on, maybe you haven't seen this lesson yet. But they want to know if this function is continuous at x equals 2. So when I have a rational function like this, the issue I'm going to have is when it divides by 0. So if I were to plug in x equals 2 right here, I'd get 2 squared minus 4, so 4 minus 4. So you're going to get a divide by 0. So when it says, is it continuous there, put a big fat no. Nope. Now what about if you plug in x equals 0? So if this is 0 squared minus 4, that's just going to be a divide by negative 4, which is fine. You're allowed to divide by negative 4. So that is a yes. Um, plugging in a 3.5, I don't really know what it is, but I know it's not going to be 0, because it's like 3.5 squared minus 4, which is something. So is it continuous? Yes, it is. And then plugging in a negative 2 right here. So you have negative 2 squared minus 4. That's going to give me 4 minus 4 in the denominator which means that's a big fat no again. We'll come back to this concept of continuity um, and what it means for your functions when we go to graph rational expressions uh, or rational equations, but for now, just know that you can't have a divide by zero. That is our discontinuity that we're talking about in that question. Is it even, odd, or neither? So the test for even and odd is that you evaluate, which I'm going to unofficially say is plug in a negative x. And then there's three outcomes, technically. The first outcome is if you get the same function then as the original, then you're even. The second outcome is that you get the opposite function, which we call negative f of x. If that happens, then you are odd. <laughs> and if none of these happen, if nothing like this happens, then we just say it's neither. So those are the algebraic tests, and I suggest you go ahead and do that. And we also have to correlate it with the idea of if it's even or odd, what kind of symmetry does it have? So let's talk about this question down here. I'm going to take the function, and I'm going to write down the skeleton, and I'm going to plug in a negative x. So when I take negative x and I square it, this becomes positive x squared times a negative 3 still. And then the plus 5 obviously isn't changing. So when I go and compare this new function to this original function, I notice they are exactly the same. So that means we have an even function. Remember, even functions are the ones that are symmetrical with the y-axis. So you say symmetry whoops, of the y-axis. So even with that symmetry. <clears throat> even functions will always have symmetry, the y-axis. I said that kind of weird, sorry. Oh boy, I'm going to run out of room. This next function right here. Let's do that work down here. So, I'm plugging in a negative x for all my x's. There we go. Negative x. Oh, this is going to be gross. Yuck. Alright. Whatever. <laughs> This is a really tricky one, huh, Bauer? This was mean. Okay, um, maybe a better idea for this one is to graph it, but I'm going to show you the algebraic manipulation of it, and please don't yell at me later when you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I never watched that. Okay, this part's not too bad. I know what's going to happen over here. Negative x squared is just going to become positive x squared, so whatever. Here, though, um, when you have negatives all over the place in a factor, you can factor the negative out. So like if I factored the negative out of this parenthesis, this becomes a plus plus. And if I factored the negative out of this parenthesis, this becomes a plus and this will become a minus. So think about what we have here, guys. We have a negative out in front and then we took another negative out in front. So these two negatives actually become positive. And then this is x plus 3 and then this is x minus 3. So I want you to compare this to this original one. And I don't know if you can see it, guys, but it's exactly the same. I know the terms are a little out of order, but they are the same. So again, we have an even function, which means we have symmetry of the y-axis. 
All right, let's look at this last one here. X to the third minus X. So when I do that little plug in negative X thing, I get, oh boy, that's ugly. <laughs> negative X to the third power minus negative X. Okay, so cleaning this up, this becomes negative X to the third power. I know I, I just said that, but that was I meant something else. Plus X, and if I compare this to the original function, I notice that these are exact opposite terms to these. So since we have the opposite function, that means you are odd, which means we have symmetry of the origin. Whoa, sorry whoever just looks at that slide. Oh my gosh, that slide looks so ugly. I should redo that, but I'm not. Hey, that's the end of our review. Okay, good news. I think you guys are ready for the test. Um, if you find that you are one of the few creatures who never actually finished their homework, you might want to just suck it up and go back and redo those homework questions. We really don't assign you many, and we're very strategic in which ones we do assign you. Um, so when we only give you six, seven, eight, nine problems, it's because there's one of every kind that we need you to know. So when you skip two questions out of seven, um, you're missing a lot of topics that you really need to practice. And you all know how math works. It's practice, 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 lots of muscle memory. All right, there's my speech for the day. Good luck, everybody.